I'm Max Pfeffer. Uh, I'm Senior Associate Dean from the College of Agriculture and Life Science. I've also uh, seen others of you a couple of days ago, and so I hope the convening has gone well. I'm here to welcome you this morning on behalf of Dean Catherine Boer and the entire faculty of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences uh, to this final day of the great uh, convening and this morning's panel on gender transformative agricultural research. So the great initiative you may have gathered is uh, sponsored by uh, the AWARE initiative at Cornell. That's advancing women in agriculture through research and education. AWARE is an effort uh, within Cal's international programs aimed at ensuring gender and uh, uh, that gender issues are addressed throughout I IP Cal's programs, uh, their entire portfolio, uh, from educational programs here on campus to research and extension efforts throughout the world. AWARE activities uh, include monthly seminars featuring international experts and Cornell faculty who are working on gender and agriculture. AWARE also hosts discussion groups for graduate students to help the development of their research in ways that are more responsive to gender issues. Through efforts such as AWARE, CALS, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, endeavors to make gender responsiveness a core emphasis of agriculture and research teaching programs. Um, and these efforts have never been more important to us than they are today. Now, you have all been talking about this for days now, and you're all aware through your own expertise how important uh, uh, women's role is in ensuring food security and community well-being. But the role of women expands far beyond uh, empty, uh, filling empty bellies and working in agriculture by providing primary care for children, by educating youth, uh, contributing to household income, attending to the needs of the elderly and infirm. Women typically glue, are the glue that binds families and communities together. Because of their central role in the health and well-being of so many, investments in empowering women lead to significant payoffs in promoting development. We can achieve significant benefits by focusing greater attention on women and their unique needs and challenges that they are faced with in agriculture. That's why initiatives like AWARE and GREAT are so important. We in CALS are proud of and excited by the tremendous promise that these efforts hold. Further, we're committed to growing our support for these, similar, these and similar programs as part of our mission to promote knowledge with public purpose that results in sustainable improvements for the lives of people everywhere. Today's panel discussion uh, features several leaders in the field of gender, agriculture, and rural development. Uh, from CALS, but also from our friends and partners at Macquarie University and also Cultural Practice LLC. I'm here, very eager to hear their perspectives on this, and I uh, welcome all of you here again today, and thank you very much for being here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Holly Tufon, and um, I work at International Programs. And I just would like to introduce our moderator this morning, which I have the pleasure of introducing. She's got such a long list of things to talk about that I don't want to take too much of your time. But the biggest thing is she was recently appointed as the director of the African Women in Agriculture Research for Development program. She's newly minted, I think six weeks into the job. So we're really happy to have her here. Before that, she founded her own NGO called Akili Dada which supported women from um, under-resourced families to really achieve their dreams. So it's an excellent initiative. And she, before that, she was an assistant professor of politics at the University of San Francisco. And her academic interest in teaching included African politics, gender, international relations, ethnicity and democratization, and the role of technology in social activism. She's received many prizes. She was the 2012 White House Champion of Change, one of the 100 most influential Africans that were nominated by New African Magazine, and a 2012 Ford Foundation Champion of Democracy. So we're really happy to have her here, and she's going to help us moderate the panel this morning and talk a bit. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hello. Well, right. 
adjusted, got our coffee, got our tea, exciting panel in front of us. Um, so what I thought we would do today is uh, uh, allow the panelists, all experts in, from a diversity of fields and really carrying experience from, from around the world, really, to share their experiences with us and then reserve a fair bit of time for us to have a conversation, whether that takes a question and answer format and then eventually grows into a town hall conversation, right? So I guess the first thing that I would ask each of our panelists to do, and maybe we'll start from my far left and work our way in, is to just tell us about yourself, tell us about your work, the institution you're located in, and the ways in which um, you have seen gender play a role or not play a role in the, the research that you do or the work that you do. Uh, thank you so much, Wanjiro. I'm called Henry Manire. I teach in the School of Gender, uh, gender and Women, Women and Gender Studies in Makere University. I've been doing so for a couple of years, coming to close three decades. My interest, though it's in gender, has also been in the field of agriculture. And uh, I find gender plays a very strong role within rural smallhold agriculture in, in Uganda, but also in much of sub-Saharan Africa. This is because unlike the agriculture in the Western world, like here in the United States or in Europe, which is carried out in a strict business sense, you know, for the market, using industrial approaches, distinct division of labor, electrical, power and labor and all that. Agriculture, rural smallholder agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa actually is carried out as a way of life. As a way of life, everybody plays a role within agriculture, like they play other roles in the productive, in the reproductive, and in the household maintenance. And you find that actually there are very many unwritten rules and norms determined by cultures which will determine who has rights to which resources at what particular time. But then gender plays a bigger role within the smallhold agriculture because feeding is social culturally a female's responsibility. So amidst all these norms and practices, we find that there could be opportunities, there could also be constraints. But whether they are opportunities or constraints, feeding remains a responsibility for females. And since the female gender has very few production entitlements, including labor entitlements, the struggle to put food on the table continues amidst very minimal resources, including resources from agricultural science and technology. So I have a feeling that research could play a very big role, especially agricultural research, because it is looking at the main sources of livelihoods for about 80% of African smallholders. It is looking at improving food and nutrition for about 80% of sub-Saharan Africa. Actually, 80% of the food consumed in sub-Saharan Africa is produced by these rural smallholders. And without much support from then? Yeah. Okay. No, but you can finish your sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have another opportunity. You can finish your sentence. Oh, what I was trying to say is that uh, statistics tell us that only 10% of the innovations are adopted in Africa. Only 10%. And the yield is about 50% of what the yield is on agricultural stations. Yeah. Oh. And then you find that we have about 45% post-harvest losses. So if it, the little we produce, we lose almost half of it. So agricultural science has a very tra big transformative role to play, not only in the livelihood, but also in the gender relations, which actually determine the forms of production we have. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm honored to address you this morning and to share my experience. Uh, the first part, as the moderator has said, is to introduce ourselves. 
By name is Margaret Najingo Mangeni, and I'm an associate professor at Makerere University in the Department of Extension and Innovation Studies. Uh, my journey with gender uh, <coughs> starts, uh, dates back about 15 years ago. I studied agriculture at my undergraduate level, so I got a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture from Makerere University. After that, I went to Ohio State. I got a scholarship, USAID, and studied agriculture education. After that, I went back to teach at Makerere. And I realized that I was actually not adequately prepared uh, to serve in a way that has impact. Many things, my eyes were open to the challenges out there in the communities. I want to point out here that during my undergraduate training, and even at Ohio State, I didn't get to consider or to look at the community that I would be serving with the training that I had received. This happened when I got a scholarship. I consider it a unique scholarship that really shaped my career. Uh, it was a program that was newly established, uh, African Women Leaders in Agriculture and Environment. It was, uh, uh, the scholarships were offered by Winrock International. It's an NGO based in the US here. And this, this scholarship was unique because it equipped, it selected carefully women leaders from the African continent and brought them to the US to get postgraduate degrees. They didn't just get training in the technical aspects of agriculture, but also in leadership and leadership for change, meaning we were equipped with skills to go back and transform the communities, the organizations where we came from. And as part of this was also awareness in the area of gender, opening our eyes to the fact that the societies we serve are differentiated and that those differences, social differentiations, have implications on the way that the different people, men and women, boys and girls, and other uh, uh, kinds of people interact with innovations, with technologies, and therefore uh, are able to change their lives. So with that combination of the, in that um, program, when I returned to Makere, I started a journey of not only doing my work as a teacher, as a professor, but also being able to interact with my colleagues and with the organization to be able to cause the change that I now believed in as being very, very important. So I started spearheading integrating gender in the curriculum. It wasn't very easy because at the time, people were teaching, you know, they are crop scientists, they are animal scientists and all that, and experts in their field. So I took on that um, effort of first of all raising awareness, uh, creating buy-in, and uh, tackling the institutional uh, policies and partnering with people. Uh, that's why I was able to partner with my colleagues in the Department of Women and Gender Studies so that this message got embraced. And I want to say that we have reached somewhere in, in, in agriculture, in, in, in the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences where I work. Uh, our mission is tripartite. We teach uh, undergraduates, postgraduates in agriculture and related fields. We also do research, agricultural research, and community service or community engagement. So by, first of all, looking at the curriculum, we, it also has spino, spillover effects in agricultural research. So we are now gradually building capacity for gender responsive research. So an initiative like GRET actually builds on to what is already ongoing in Makerere, and I'm really proud to be part of it, and to thank Cornell for coming to partner with us to do something that we hold dear as Makere and as Uganda. I thank you very much. So my name is Deborah Rubin. I'm the director of a small company. So I'm a private sector representative sitting up here in the sea of academics. My company is called Cultural Practice, and that's because I was trained as an anthropologist. And the purpose of the company is to, when we started it, was to try and translate the findings of research into practice in the world of development. Now, Margaret reminded me of how important the role of fellowships are in building the kind of experiences that one brings to the workplace. And I myself got to benefit from that in my uh, postdoctoral work in Kenya as a fellow of the Rockefeller 
Foundation's um, postdoctoral program in agriculture and rural development. So just a, a shout out to that and the, the other kinds of fellowships, including the award fellows, um, that really helped to shape our work uh, in development. So I started the company about 14 years ago. And I want to just lay out four ways in which we work on gender. I loved Margaret's phrase about the journey with gender that we all have. So I've been interested in gender from the beginning of my undergraduate career. But in the company, we do four things. And, and I'm breaking this out because so often we talk about integrating gender in agriculture as if it's a single activity. And it's not. It's a lot of different things. And we need to build the skills, as we've been talking about for the last few days, in all of those areas. So we do, um, we provide a lot of technical assistance. We help people who are running projects look at the ways in which they're working with women to try and understand all the things that Margaret and Henry have already said about women's often disadvantaged positions, but sometimes privileged positions, like in caring for the family, and to analyze the way in which those gender roles and relationships affect your ability to actually achieve the results of your projects. So providing that technical assistance is a big piece of what we do, writing manuals and giving trainings. We also help um, projects or institutions change the way that they work uh, with gender. So we uh, try to create strategies for more equitable opportunities within a project or within an institution. And I hope to talk more about that um, later. I also mentioned that we design and conduct trainings because providing people with the technical knowledge is a really important piece of making change um, in an institution uh, and developing a training so that it provides information that people can actually apply to their own circumstances is, is very important. And finally, we do evaluation. So we look at the way in which a project or an institution has addressed gender in the past in a particular environment, and we identify ways in which they could do it better. So those four areas, I um, hope I've given you a bit of insight into unpacking what it means to integrate gender, and we'll continue with that in a bit. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, don't interrupt my applause there. <laughs> Sorry. Good morning. Um, I'm Prabhu Pingali. I'm uh, a professor in applied economics uh, here at Cornell. And I'm also the director of the Tata Cornell program on agriculture and nutrition, a uh, newly established program uh, that I've had the honor to uh, becoming the founding director of and to help build up this program. Um, before coming to Cornell, I was the deputy director for agriculture at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in Seattle. Um, let me give you a little bit of a background on the Tata Cornell program. Um, as many of you know, Ratan Tata is uh, a billionaire in India. Uh, many of our African colleagues will recognize the name from the trucks that drive around <laughs> in Africa. Um, so Mr. Tata actually gave a gift to Cornell uh, a couple of years ago to start this program. And it was a $25 million gift. And essentially, uh, he was concerned about the fact that India is growing rapidly, but India continues to have the highest levels of hunger, and malnutrition, and poverty, especially in rural areas. And he was trying to figure out what's going wrong and what can we do about it. And so that's what our program is trying to do. So what we started to look at is, how do you address the problem of stunting in India, uh, childhood stunting? And, and as we think about stunting, uh, the, the big window of opportunity is the first 1,000 days of a child's life, from the point of conception up to the second birthday. If we can get that period right in terms of improved nutrition, then you address the problem of stunting in a major way. But then when you think about that, when you think about the idea that it's from conception onwards, then, then the problem is how do you address health and nutrition of the mother. 
And if a mother is healthy at the point of conception, then she has a healthy pregnancy and, and then can have a healthy baby and wean the baby through the two years. And so the focus of our program moved towards women of childbearing age and looking at improving nutrition for women of childbearing age in rural areas of India. And as you think about that, the issue of nutrition is important. But as Henry was saying, a large part of what women do in rural areas is work on agriculture. So the labor use, the type of labor they have, uh, the type of agriculture production they have, uh, the type of household labor, and all of that plays a really important role in the trade-offs between improved health of the women and their ability to do child rearing, etc. So it's that huge set of trade-offs between agriculture, between nutrition, the positive issues, the negative issues. These are all things that we're doing in our program. Just one last word. Um, my program is essentially run through PhD students. And one of the requirements that I have for every PhD student who joins my program is that they should spend one year in the field in rural India. That's not a debatable option. That's a requirement in our program. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, my name is Goreti Nabanoga. I'm from Uganda, and I'm female. I have no doubt about that. <laughs> I'm an associate professor in social forestry, and I'm currently the deputy principal of the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. I feel a bit honored to be here discussing with agriculturists in the traditional sense. And I happen to be from the natural resources sector. My first degree was in forestry. I did a second degree in uh, natural resources management, which actually, at the beginning, we thought that forestry was a male-dominated uh, discipline. And in my class, I remember we were only two female out of uh, about 35 in the group. So from that moment, I started wondering why forestry as a discipline has always been <coughs> dominated and it's at the time when I did my masters that I began to realize that some of these disciplines are actually uh, cultivated from the cultural backgrounds that and mentalities that people have so as I did my masters in the Netherlands and sorry in Norway I began to realize that there are certain aspects within life and as we try to improve our livelihoods that are generally, uh, I'll call it gendered now, but then I didn't know the difference between gender and all I thought about is you being a female or a male. And later, during one of my researches, I did realize that for us to be able to improve the situations, the poverty, the livelihoods where we come from, we need to pay attention to certain aspects within the communities we come from, within the cultural settings, uh, mainly based on the norms that govern how we behave. And uh, in 2000, I was in the Netherlands. I was privileged to get um, a scholarship where I did a PhD. And having been a physical scientist. I started thinking about looking at the social scientists. And my PhD at Wageningen University entailed looking at the social aspects of forest management and natural resources management. And that's when the challenges started for me. Because as a PhD student, I was used to research that was very physical, looking at the trees, looking at the systems within the forest. And I forgot that everything we do within these resources have a connotation towards society. The people who use the trees, the people who use the different resources that come from trees and from the ecosystems. And then it was at that time when I was in the Department of Forest at Wageningen University that I realized that the science I had about trees, 
and about natural resources was not enough. So I was advised to take on a professor of social sciences. I think it's that professor that actually opened my eyes to the differences of the different activities that take place within society and which are actually governed by not only you being a male or a female, but also the relations you have between each other. Because at the beginning, I felt that all women are the same as a category. And later, I did realize that even within the category women, there are so many differences that you can't generalize about that group. And this helped my research so much that eventually I started understanding and differentiating what we see in reality vis-a-vis -vis what we take as common uh, understandings or denominations of uh, beliefs. So I also then started questioning my own understanding of some of the aspects that I was dealing with. And it was actually interesting that when I took gender classes, the only thing I knew about gender was the roles and responsibility that being female or male entailed. But to date, having involved myself in a lot of uh, discussions, I'm beginning to discern some of the assumptions because there are a lot of other things other than being male or female or gender in this respect that govern how we behave. And these are basically the relationships we have, who we interact with, uh, the power that be, because some of these societies are very male dominated. And if you think about it, everything is patriarchal. And we tend to follow that trend without questioning. But the moment you begin to look at the relations that there, then you begin to unveil why are the social norms dictating that this should be? Who has the power to propagate this particular uh, thinking? And that has actually um, helped me understand. And I appreciate great, in particular, that I think it needs to turn our thinking, we change our mindsets to be able to begin thinking beyond whether I'm a woman or a man. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Last, not, but certainly not least. Good morning, everybody. My name is Michael Gore. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Plant Breeding and Genetics. And I came back to Cornell in April of last year. And I will say, in terms of agricultural research, I had been operating gender blind for the majority of my life. And this transformative experience that I had last year is when I was able to travel to Uganda and Kenya last year. And that's when I, I would say I maybe truly began to have my conversion, if you will, to really appreciate and understand gender as it can relate to applied agricultural research to enhance the quality of life of smallholder farmers in Africa, which are predominantly headed by women. Now, my research is, for the majority, focusing on nutritional quality in crops. So I quickly realized when, after week two, when I was in Kenya, that if my research is to have an applied focus and to be able to have impact on the way of life and families of these smallholder farmers, I really need to be more gender responsive and even potentially gender transformative in my research because without having that appreciation, there is no guarantee that after maybe eight to 10 years of developing a particular cultivar, not taking into account gender preferences for certain quality traits such as taste, if I don't factor that in, and being able to fully understand the variance within gender uh, between the two gender groups and the um, relationship of those interactions to the agricultural product, then my product being an enhanced nutritional value cultivar may not be even consumed or used by the people that I'm trying to help the most. And that is something that 
really opened my eyes and was really uh, part of my con conversion. And now I am really be beginning to, like, if you will, sh share the word with my colleagues that if they have any direct application for their research to any smallholder farmers, then they really need to factor this in into their research. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess at this point, I want to ask uh, the second and, and kind of the last formal question that I'd like to ask our panelists, which is this question that, that has been on our minds. Can agricultural research be gender transformative? And I just want to underline this word, transformative. Are we doing add women and stir, or is there potential to transform? And what would that look like in your field? From where you stand and the work that you do with your research on a daily basis, what do you see, if any, as the potential for transformation? Um, and we'll, we'll be fair and we'll go right back to, the, to, to, to where we started, if you don't mind. Yeah, thank you, Wanjiru. I usually like to take the the military conceptualization of transformation. And because the military has been undergoing so many defense reviews, both in the third world and in the first world. And they've been trying to come to grasp with what transformation stands for. And then one senior defense leader says, if you want transformation, you go where the money is and change the rules. Yeah. The rules. Yeah, you go where the money is and change the rules. I mean, the rules of allocation. So beyond the money, of course, power, other resources. So within that conceptualization, can agricultural research become gender transformative? Gender itself is a subject of exclusion, is a subject of unfavorable inclusion within the development process. Gender is a question of power relations. So can we change these power relations such that we have a change? Sorry, Richard, do, you, do you mind bringing the mic closer to, to you? And Around? speaking up, I'm hearing it's hard. It's yeah. hard is it OK now? Even closer. Actually. Much closer? <laughs> is it OK? Maybe the volume is low. Now, is it on? Yeah, it's on. It's, it's on. on. It's on. Let's just all speak louder, because okay. we want to make sure we are high. Yeah. Yeah. So if we had to look at research, how can we change the unequal power relations between females and males? Agricultural research itself is a resource. It's information. It's innovations. It is technologies. It is agronomic practices. Yeah. But Agricultural uh, research itself hasn't escaped the subtle and obvious exclusion of smallholder farmers, of female farmers, especially <coughs> in sub-Saharan Africa. So yes, sub -Sah agricultural research has a lot to offer in terms of technologies and practices and other innovations. But if it has to do it, then it has to be very gender conscious. It has to be very gender conscious. Now, in the discipline of agricultural science itself, of course, they are not trained to become gender conscious. So agricultural science from the agri uh, agricultural research, from the physical science perspective, may not have the methodological or the theoretical or the conceptual requirements to carry out transformation. Though the products of agricultural science are very transformative, they can transform smallholder agriculture you know, from its below potential productivity to very much, much higher potential. So the collaboration being brought about by GREAT, where you can have social scientists, where you can have gender analysts, working hand in hand as partners 
with the agricultural researchers can transform not only the gender relations within smallholder agriculture, but all the entire livelihoods within smallholder agriculture. Thank you, thank you. And I realize here, it, 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 it's a bit of a trick question, eh? because I did not define what gender transform transformation looks like. And here I have left it up to our panelists to define for yourselves and for within the spaces that you work, what that might look like. I'm not assuming there's a pre-written. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, gender, can agricultural research be gender transformative? Gender transformative, in my opinion, is really, it's an emotive word because we are talking about gender, we are talking about culture and things that society holds dear. So when you come and you want to change things, it is something that is likely to be unsettling. And as, we, as uh, some panelists have mentioned, it's about power relations. <coughs> so when you say transform, it means you are touching the power hierarchy and you know, who has control over what resources. So whenever we talk about changing the status quo, I think many of us are very uncomfortable. So when we say can agricultural research be gender transformative, to me I think yes, it, it can, but it calls for certain changes at different <coughs> levels. And for the researchers, it calls to a willingness, which is not easy sometimes, to ask new research questions that sometimes we don't ask, such that it's not just about the technologies that we, we, we generate and, and other things, but we want to ask how are these technologies interacting and interfacing with communities? And when they cause certain changes, how can these changes be, be uh, how can the negative and positive aspects be brought forward? It, it's a, also calling for a need to partner with new partners, work with different kinds of um, uh, people and uh, professionals that maybe we normally don't interact with. It calls for interdisciplinarity and questioning assumptions of what we think is research or knowledge so that we are not in our, what I'll call, you know, professional or disciplinary silos, but we are willing to perforate walls within those and listen and understand others and be able to work together. And that means you are looking at the end goal in mind. Many times all of us who are trained as, as, as researchers, as academics, you really have spent a lot of time learning those methodologies that you think generate meaningful knowledge and what you call is a science. But if you were to now look at the end in mind, look at those communities, those lives transformed, the, 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 the community is able to feed themselves, the, the children, the nutrition, they are well nourished, you know, the issues that we've been talking about. If you have that in mind, to me, it's a motivation to learn to unlearn and learn new things. Because you are not just after that publication uh, you know, in a high impact journal, but you are also motivated by seeing your research results causing a meaningful change out there, really solving the problems of humanity. So I think it calls for a, my, you know, really a change in many, a willingness to change on the part of us as, 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 as scientists, but also the institutions where we come from. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so if I take the question as it was stated to us, can agricultural research be gender transformative? I'm going to say maybe. I'm not going to say yes. I'm going to say maybe because it means that you have to change the kind of topics that agricultural research addresses in order to meet the needs, as was stated by the other uh, two panelists here, about um, men and women in the field, so that they transfer with that. But if we, if we change the question, if we, if we ask the question, can the application of agricultural research be gender transformative, then I would say absolutely. Right? Because the application of research that we already have, the application of new research, when it's out there, can do amazing things to change gender relations, to create greater equality so that people's livelihoods actually help them um, live in the world. 
But I mentioned earlier in my three minutes that we do a lot of different things to try and achieve gender integration in projects, in agricultural development projects. Uh, but I strongly believe that technical knowledge is not enough. So the great program is going to provide that technical knowledge. And it's, I think the way it's being designed, it's an amazing um, effort to combine social and natural scientists and to, to create a body of technical knowledge with gender at the center. But to really achieve that gender transformation, I think we need to totally change the institutions in which we're working. And I want to call your attention, because I don't have time here, to a case study that was done of the Harvard Business School, which was published last fall. And it's an amazing study. You can Google it, find it online. But what was done was to take the way, it, not, not simply to change the content of the curriculum at the Harvard, Harvard Business School, but to completely transform the way that the school operated. So they put researchers into the classrooms to, to measure how many women were speaking, how many men were speaking, how did the faculty interact with the men and women students. They looked at the kind of clubs that men and women joined. They went to the bars to see what kind of interaction there was between the men and women students. And they tried to create a climate, an institution climate of equality. They did not achieve perfect results, but they achieved something. And I would suggest that to really make the kind of difference that we want to see out in the field, we need to start transforming the halls of the academy, and that we can do that through the great program if we take the learning of this Harvard Business School model and to try and create a very equitable environment in the institution. Then we will achieve gender transformation out in the field as well as here at home. Fantastic. Thank you. So can uh, agriculture research be gender transformative? It can, but it doesn't. And it doesn't because we fail to change behavior of researchers. Um, let me give you a story. So I joined the CJIR system uh, in 1987 when I moved to Los Banos, Philippines to join Erie. Rebecca Nelson, who's sitting at the back there, was my colleague at Erie also. And she knows these stories quite well. Um, and then I was in CIMIT after that. So I spent 15 years in the CJIR. And the issue of gender and the importance of training plant breeders and looking at gender aspects of plant breeding, looking at what women want, women farmers and women consumers want in terms of better quality and characteristics of um, the modern high-yielding varieties of rice wheat, etc. These were issues that were coming up in the late 80s, early 90s. We had lots of specialists on gender come to Erie. We even had embedded gender scientists in Erie who were there working with scientists, etc. Numerous training programs. Um, did they have an impact? I'm not sure. And I think as you start a new program, it's really important to say, We've got 30 years of experience in these types of programs. Why have these programs not worked? What's the gap here? How do you create behavior change in agriculture scientists? If you can't answer that question up front, or if you don't have a hypothesis for answering that question up front, then starting another program doesn't make sense. I really think you need to take that big step first. Second, let me talk about the technology delivery, and we haven't talked so much about that. We've been complaining a lot in, in agriculture about the poor quality of extension services. The fact that you don't have enough women in extension services, that men are talking to women who are doing the farming, etc. But I've been seeing something absolutely incredible happening in India today. In India today, you're beginning to see women self-help groups across rural India. There are about three million of them now. Many of these women self-help groups started off as microcredit groups. 
But now they've taken out a broader agriculture, rural development, resource management agenda. And what I find amazing, and I visited about two dozen of these groups in the last year, what I find amazing is these groups are now setting the agenda for development. They're saying this is what we need in our community, and they're interfacing with donors and saying we will implement your agenda um, as long as it's our agenda. And that's been a transformative change that I've begun to see. Is it working in all three million self-help groups? No. It's working in a small subset of them. But where is it working? It's working in the communities where the, the women, a small group of women within those self-help groups have the capacity to manage, coordinate, and create the, the infrastructure for the group to function, the group to be able to take on these responsibilities, et cetera. What we need to do as agriculture scientists is to say, how do we create more of these well-functioning groups? How do we use our technologies to be able to interface with these groups? How do we use some of the digital technologies to be able to provide better extension through these groups, et cetera, et cetera? There's a whole set of work that needs to be done, some of which we are starting up in my program. But this is a whole new exciting area of getting women involved in uh, agriculture development and creating transformative change. OK, thank you. It's usually difficult to speak when uh, the people with very good ideas have actually <laughs> put them across. And, and I tend to get back and I tend to get back a little to the question, was it agricultural transformation or gender transformation? Because when I think about the two, and looking at what we are trying to do, I believe that transformation for agriculture is for a purpose, okay? And the purpose would be probably to improve, to move, transformation is about movement from a situation to probably a better situation, I would presume. And if it's moving towards the better situation, then it means that whatever we do has to ensure that all the activities involved in that transformation processes are actually benefiting other than reducing the benefits, if I may put it that way. So when I bring it to the gender, we need to question ourselves, what have we been doing as of today that has brought the situation to necessitate a transformation? And if we are going to conduct that transformation, we need something like a baseline. What is happening now? We've all been talking about gender. And for a long time, we've related gender to the roles and responsibilities. It hasn't worked, like my colleagues have mentioned. For 30 years, we are looking at who does what in the family, how does it benefit, what impact it has. And the challenge now is if we want that transformation, what is it that we are going to do differently? What is it that we haven't done that needs to be done? And I believe that um, we need to begin looking beyond what we have always assumed. Like my colleague just mentioned a few minutes ago that we all hold assumptions. This has to be that, that should be that. And none of us is actually questioning why it is the way it is. None of us is bringing up um, ideas on how to change it or has anybody analyzed to see what needs to be changed or what is good about the status quo, what can we retain, or what can we discard? Because I believe that in this transformation process, especially in relation to gender, we will have losers, we will have winners, but we are looking for a win-win situation. Given that culture is basically at all our hearts, you grow up in a culture, you're cultivated there, if I may use that word, and changing becomes a big problem. If we don't identify those critical reasons, the why 
it should change, then we are not making any headway. Because we've been there for the last 30 years, we haven't realized that much change. And I believe that um, the reason great is coming in place, it's a great idea itself, but it needs to question what has been for us to understand what is going. But like um, they have already said, that's why I said it was difficult to speak when others have. We need to have an end in mind. What is it that we want to see so many years or from today onwards that has not been that good in the past. And I believe that with transformation, those are some of the questions we need to look at. Are we transforming agriculture or we are transforming our gender beliefs? Thank you. <clears throat> so for me, this has been a truly humbling experience because as I was saying, I'm, I have been gender blind, but maybe I'm gender myopic now. <laughs> I, I still have a, a great deal to, to learn, and over these past few days, I've been able to soak in a lot of the tremendous wisdom that my new gender colleagues has, have been able to share with us. And when I think about transformation, and coming from the agricultural science realm, I have a lot of tremendous colleagues that they're able to publish tremendous glossy papers in high impact journals. And I think all of them would probably say they hope that their research is able to help the downstream end users and consumers. Now, it took me a trip to Uganda and Kenya to, to realize and, if you will, have a conversion to understand the importance that gender can have in one's research. Now, I am very open to change. I'm very fluid. But the vast reality of it is perhaps not everyone is that same way. How do we help our colleagues in the hard sciences understand that having an understanding of the role that gender plays for their end users, i.e. farmers, and when I speak of farmers, it's not just like in the US Midwest corn farmers, we're talking about smallholder farmers in say Sub-Saharan Africa, okay? How do we convince our colleagues that they need to maybe begin to consider gender? So me, as an agricultural scientist, plant breeder, I have you know people on staff now that are engineers, computer programmers. Do I need to begin thinking about having a gender expert on my staff as well, so that before, at the planning phase, before I start any new project, do we go out and we take surveys to really understand the, the target populations? Because we really understand the science well, but there is a tremendous disconnect between the researcher and the end user. So how do we bridge that gap? And I think that's maybe one of the most challenging questions. And I don't think there's a clear answer, because if there was a clear answer, we wouldn't be sitting here before you. Okay. So how do you make your colleagues become more aware of how great this resource is, puns intended. So I think one possible way is this all starts with the funding agencies. If there are certain funding agencies that are funding research projects that are applied and focused on smallholder farmers, there should be almost a requirement that these research questions need to be gender responsive. Now, if you will, if the, funding, if the funding agency is beginning to ask these questions, that will get the attention of my colleagues. And they will then get out of their comfort zone, like I have, and they will begin to explore this question with some of the experts that I, I have met with and have truly enjoyed my time with over these past two days. 
Thank you. And uh, uh, thanks to, to all the panelists for really taking this question seriously and giving us so many different directions in which our conversation can go. We now have a, about half an hour to engage in question and answer and really a town hall conversation on the points that have been brought up uh, by the panelists as well as your own thinking and, and what uh, your reaction to it. So I think we'll just do a sh hand up. Sarah, yes? Um, hi, thanks for the, the great comments, everyone on the panel. I have a couple of questions. I'll just say them quickly, and you can answer them if the time to it. And let's take like two or three at a time, and then do that. So it looks like at two or three at a time, we'll probably get three people in. Great. So um, for Deborah Rubin, the Harvard Business School study is, is a great um, but a very interesting case study. I wonder if you could be a little bit specific about any of the practices that you saw in that case study that could apply to this curriculum development. And for Prabhu, I wonder what you thought, what are some of the reasons you think that the gender initiatives that you saw in the last couple of decades didn't work? And for um, Mike, I wonder, you, you talked about going to Kenya and Uganda as being transformative. If you could be a little bit more specific about what you saw that changed your Okay. Um, I'd like to react to the comments of Prabhu and Michael that I, I would receive a sort of an indictment of uh, not, not only the gender focus that's been going on for decades, but also the research system more broadly. And I want to just sort of uh, consider what those diagnoses are and, and what they might imply. Um, and in particular, I'd like to consider whether or not they should be taken much further, not only to look at gender differences, but to look more broadly at heterogeneity, both personal as well as biophysical, amongst um, the millions of smallholders that we're supposedly serving. And probably in particular, I thinking of your point about the three million women self-help groups, I really feel um, very much on that same exact page that our problem is that we're too elitist and tough out of the way we look at ag research in general, and that if we were able to radicalize further, be more bottom up, and actually be more directly serving though that world infrastructure of local uh, community groups, that we could actually um, be transformative. But it would take a huge transformation in the way that we pursue the, the research effort. And I agree with you in terms of some of the opportunities that the present moment presents. Um, so I just want to look at the two ways that we can go about maybe what you're saying, Michael, about do I put a gender person on my team? And I, I feel like we kind of face this bifurcation of like either bureaucratization of the idea or radicalization of the idea. And I just want to push for the radicalization <laughs> instead of the bureaucratization. I think we've kind of gone down the bureaucratization path with gender, and it hasn't served us that well. I think we've got to go more hardcore radicalization a more bottom-up vision of the research process to deal with the heterogeneity that goes well beyond gender. And maybe if I can take that question and expand it to the to, to the actually the whole panel, do, do you think we have been too top down in in our in our I mean that's what I'm a lot of what I'm reading is that have, has agricultural research been too top down and by virtue of that both in design and, and carrying out and, and thinking and by virtue of that has led to some negative effects. I I want to uh, build on. These remark about the power study. I just recently read in the Harvard Business Review a study about um, the case studies that are being used in the MBA program, by MBA programs maybe, um, where uh, about, I, I can't remember the exact number, but something like 53 case studies are being used in this program. Out of those, 47 are completely featuring men as the leaders, role models, whatever. <laughs> the six that actually feature women in some kind of role in a, let's say, less than august leadership role. Here we are <laughs> representing one of the Ivy League institutions in this country building the future leadership in agriculture. One of the most august institutions in Africa building Africa's leadership in agriculture research. Are we looking as faculty at the material that we present to these young people that we're educating? Or you know, do we just repli replicate the status quo that we have? So I, I would like to throw this out, please. 
I'm totally going to like break one of the first rules of being a moderator and throw in a question myself <laughs> um, that, that tags onto what um, Helga just said. And I, I listened keenly as, as a couple of you shared personal life stories, maybe about being a woman in the field and, and the experiences that you've had as a woman in the field. Uh, for Michael having have traveled to Uganda, those personal experiences. To what extent do the, the identities and location, specificities of who scientists, researchers are, impact the field as a whole? I think it's really powerful <coughs> that you're sending students to India and saying you must be there for a year because it will impact how you think. Um, a, a lot of our, our um, sisters and brother on the con brothers on the continent travel abroad and, and have these transformative experiences. I wonder if you could speak to that and the importance of scientists' personal experiences in some of the transformations that we're trying to drive. And it's a biased question, being that I'm at a word, and um, we, work at, we, we curate very personal experiences for scientists. Um, one last one, and then we'll do another round. Consola. Um, uh, thank you very much, Nina. Thank you for the, the, the panelists for what you've given us. My question is, um, you've been doing quite a lot of research yourselves, and you have students who have been doing research. Has in that research been transformative in any way? So maybe you can give us some of those, they may be small. And the question is then again, how are we looking at transformation? Transformation is a process. And we may be looking at these big, looking at big things, being able to transform the entire country. And I would like to go back to what Professor Pidani said because it requires changing behaviors. Now, changing behaviors is not achieved in a day, in a year. It, it is a process. And so within that process, of course, we are looking at paradigm shifts. We are looking at biophysical, uh, changing what they do, how they do, where they do and why they do their research. And that is not a short process for them to change their minds. And so if we want that mind change, we have actually to go in phases. And so in looking at the biophysical system, the biophysical researchers is one. And this is where I think great is going to make a big change. Because we have the biophysicals and the social scientists who are going to be coming together. And I think that's what we bring change. But how do we change? I think that's what you're looking at, the extent of change. But the change is going to be there. And at times we don't see that it is there. Thank you so much. And I'm going to give a heads up. I know we have some Cornell students in the room. The next round, round of questions, I'm going to target Cornell students. So if you're a Cornell student in the room, just know. Next round, I'm picking on you. So, um, And then I will allow our panelists three minutes each, a maximum of three minutes each, to respond to any or all of the selection of, of the questions. So, uh, and we can start with you, Michael, okay. and maybe work our way in reverse. Okay. So thank you for all the wonderful questions, all very challenging. Um, but I've had at least a few seconds and moments to collect my thoughts. So in, in terms of like the transformative experience for me of the uh, trip to Uganda and Kenya, so say um, I was able to contrast like a large um, location like Kampala in Uganda and then had the opportunity to go out in 
to the countryside, if you will, and see the smallholder farmers, and then look to see how you know the, the crops were planted, um, how crops were produced, harvested, processed, and cooked. And a lot of what I saw was a woman doing the majority of the labor while tending to children. And I didn't see any tractors or men. And that, that is, I, I think, for, for me, when I began to, I guess, have that transformation. And so I, I think the transformation is going to be a unique experience for everyone. That's just something that, that had reached me. Now, how do we have some type of experience that can be transformative for our colleagues, for them to begin developing gender responsive research questions when they're having an applied research project that's focused on smallholder farmers? So that's, that's kind of the question that I even challenge you and myself with. In, in terms of being radical, Rebecca, so I don't know if this is radical or not, but um, so this uh, fall, I'm advising a graduate student that's working on cassava that's focused on traits. So these are certain phenotypes that are important to gender, being what certain traits, i.e. cooking quality, harvestability, that are important to women who are mainly doing the harvesting and <coughs> processing of cassava roots. Now, being a radical person myself, I wouldn't want to stop there, Rebecca. I would love to have a gender expert on my staff and begin to, in a sense, transform my departmental colleagues thinking that they need to factor in this into their research. Because I know all my colleagues, bless them all, they want to have an impact on their end users and consumers. And I think this would be a way to start and having, breaking the, the, the old paradigm and having like an actual paragon. Thank you. Yeah, I'll attempt to talk about um, the question that came from, I think, was it Sarah, about the experiences and context specific aspects. I believe that um, it's important to have these personal experiences and specifically to share them given their context. Because this is where we derive the lessons in as we try to, to implement the transformation. And this transformation will occur differently in different regions. Because some, like for us who come from the African continent, we are all Africans, but the cultures are so diverse within the African continent to the extent that even within a single country, you have diverse situations. So if we don't take this into account, then we are missing the bigger picture. And we need to share because we shouldn't have the assumption that what works in Uganda in the central region works in the northern or southern region or even in the neighboring country. The other bit I want to express that relates to experiences also creates learning lessons or learning points. And we have to be careful when we are implementing um, the gender aspects, especially in our researches, we need to look at the end. Because as plant breeders, we may be, for instance, breeding for <coughs> yield. But we need to think about how it's going to be when those yields are actually actualized. We have an example that we usually give to our students in Uganda about uh, this particular project that aimed at transforming the livelihoods of women in Nigeria. And women in Nigeria grow a lot of cassava, but they're doing it on a small scale. The, actually, the yields were pretty low. And this project came in to increase the yields 
and make women more visible in the markets and more money because they'll be selling the excess cassava. And what happens? They grow the cassava, the yields are high, the women start to sell the cassava, now they have money in their pockets. So they begin to do other things other than growing uh, the cassava and they are able to acquire other assets. You know what happens? The men begin become so frustrated because now the women are more powerful they can do things without consultation. And this, in a year, caused up to 40% divorces. Is this what we are looking for? So we need to really think, when you take action X, what does it have in the cultural setting? And as we talk about transformation, this is what I, I come back to. Are we transforming agriculture? Are, are we transforming gender relations? Thank you. Thank you. So let me um, address a couple of questions. So the first one, Sarah asked about um, why many of these gender programs haven't worked in changing behavior. And I think it's, it's not that um, people don't want to change behavior. People are responding to uh, the signals that they get. So in the CJIR system, the signal that breeders will get is, Food security is important, increasing the pile of grain is important, and therefore yields are important. So all performance measurement is based on yield improvement. And as long as performance is based on yield improvement, then you don't give as much attention to all the other traits that are important. And I think that drives a lot of the behavior. And as markets change, as incomes grow, as consumers ask for more quality, et cetera, you begin to see that change happening. And that's where one needs to have much more bottom-up information which says, you know, this is what consumers want, this is what rural women want, et cetera. And, and to Rebecca, I think it's really important to get to that bottom-up approach the question that I've grappled with pretty much all my career is how in the world are we going to do that? Because how do we get beyond saying, OK, I visited this little village, and I saw these three people, and they said this to me, and therefore this is influencing my agenda to a more broader, abstract version <coughs> of a bottoms-up information that comes out. And, and the reason why the CGIR system has had a social sciences department is essentially to do that, to, to create that. Um, but the social sciences divisions in the CGIR have become as siloized as the breeding departments. And the connection between the two has been very limited. Let me tell you another story. When, as a young economist, when I went to Erie, uh, I interviewed with uh, with a very famous plant breeder. And this plant breeder told me, he said, you need only two types of people in the CGIAR. You need plant breeders and economists. <laughs> so I said, really? He said, yeah, because plant breeders do the work and economists talk about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so your job is to talk about it. So you see, the perception wasn't that you learn from social sciences and change your program. The per perception was social sciences are here to do a certain thing for you. And that perception has to change. I'm not sure it's changing. If I have one minute, I want to come back to something Michael said about the role of funding agencies. Um, as a former donor uh, myself, I had to deal with this a lot for several years about getting gender into agriculture programs, et cetera. And, and donors can play a useful role in promoting their gender, but donors cannot influence the way it's implemented. And this is where I think we have a serious problem. Because one can go in and say, you know, you need to make sure you have uh, the gender perspective in your breeding program, et cetera. And people write it into the proposals. But after the, pro after the grant is made, you lose control on it. And I think getting that control back, not through donors, but some other way, to make sure it happens is a big challenge. Thank you. 
Well, I agree with Prabhu on a number of things that, uh, that he's mentioned. I think this idea of institutional transformation and how we're going to do it is very much about changing the reward system, changing the incentive system. And I think Helga already started to answer the question that you asked, Sarah, because she's talking about taking a very critical look at the kind of teaching materials that are being used. Um, the GREAT program already made a change in just the few days that we've been working here in deciding that they're going to try and combine or to link natural and, and social sciences in this program, which I think is really important. But there are several other areas where I think we can help that institutional change along. And one of them is really looking very critically at the vocabulary that we use. And the program has an opportunity to standardize in a radical way the kind of vocabulary that we use when we're talking about gender, gender issues, gender relations. I'm very tired of hearing gender used as a synonym for women. That's not what it means. I'm very tired of hearing gender being used as a synonym for sex. That's not what it means. I'm very tired of hearing gender used as if it is a thing instead of a relationship, instead of a set of social categories that we create. They are not natural. They're part of our social being, and we learn them through our socialization. So if we can use this program in a way to really emphasize that sociality, if that's a word, of gender, I think that would go an enormous way. So that vocabulary piece is important. The teaching materials Helga already mentioned. What about the selection process? Let's look really critically at who it is that we're going to bring into this program. Do we have to have the same number of male bodies and female bodies? No. You know, let, let's figure out how we're going to decide what the criteria are for deciding who should be part of this new and innovative program and how they're going to be the ones to go out and, and, and live in the world differently. Similarly, who's going to teach in this program? We don't want to bring in the same old, same old people who have been teaching the wrong way for 30 years, right? We want some people who are going to teach, who are going to really be open to these new ideas, and who are going to convey to their students through their own modeling of the issues what it is that they want to see in these researchers when they're out in the field. And I think the big message from the Harvard Business School model is the change in pedagogical techniques. So that, as I said, it's not just about the content, but about the way that you teach, about the way in which you're allowing both men and women to participate in the classroom, about the way in which you are learning to see the way that Michael learned to see when he went to the field who's doing what out there in those villages um, on, on those plots. So I think those are some initial ways um, that we can really begin to build that transformation at Cornell and at Macquarie, and hopefully you know, have an influence much wider around the world, so that 20 years from now we can have this meeting again and work on a next generation, if I can borrow a phrase from Cassava, um, about what gender issues are going to look like. And maybe, maybe we'll decide at that meeting that you know, we've answered a lot of the questions, and we won't be coming back 30 years late, later saying, oh, we haven't dealt with this again. Thank you. Time is running out. Um, I wanted to touch on two things that uh, Consolata raised. The first one was a personal question to us. Has the research we've been doing with our students <coughs> been transformative, right? Um, in my opinion, I think we could do more. I haven't, I'm not satisfied that I've achieved enough in that area. Uh, I also agree with you that we make small changes that are cumulative over time. And as you said that, something came to mind, which I hope we can achieve under great. We have this vision of being able to really get like-minded people engaging, people who, you know, research scientists, both social and biophysical, who now care about the issues of gender and impact and, you know, research that really makes a difference in the lives of people. So I'm hoping that we shall be able to crystallize, first of all, 
crystallize very clearly the change that we want to see, the transformation that we want to see. Because it's only then that we can be able to measure where we are right now, and then as we progress, we are able to track the change. So when you ask that question, it got me thinking, actually, and I said, well, have, has the research I've been doing made a difference or made a transformation? I couldn't answer that question very clearly or convincingly because I had not taken time to reflect on what transformation would mean. And, and I think it would be important for great or us as professionals who are now engaging on this subject to be clear on that. And I also draw up on another comment made by, by, by someone that this is not only about us. The communities out there you know, that are impacted by our research also have a stake in this because we throw out our technologies and research products to them, but really it is their lives as well. So we need to understand how they perceive the status quo the transformation they want to see, so that we shape the, 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 really the transformation we want. It's shaped by a dialogue, an interaction of us and them. And that's why I say it, it requires for a new form of engagement for researchers, <coughs> engaging with communities as partners in research, not just in terms of setting the agenda and this consultation we are normally asked to do, what are the research questions, but also getting their vision of what they perceive the status to be, and if we are asking for, sorry, we are looking towards gender transformation, what transformation do they want to see? And how can our perception of it and theirs merge so that at the end of the day, both can say we have succeeded in, in, in our journey towards transformation? Thank you. Sorry. Thank uh, you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, whether our research can be transformative depends on how we really conceptualize our agriculture. Because smallholder agriculture is part of the general culture. There are so many cultures within side there, and the agriculture just happens to be uh, one of them. Now the question is, has agricultural science and social science itself attempted even to be transformative, or it has just maintained the status quo. For example, if you look from a gender perspective, when we talk about agriculture being responsive to gender, we are talking about nutrition and food. So we are extending the stereotypes. Since women are in charge of nutrition and food, if our agricultural endeavors, uh, endeavor rather improve food and nutrition, then we are being gender conscious. But surely, food and nutrition should be outcomes of a much wider goal, yeah? a much, much uh, livelihood goal. So currently, our conceptualization of agricultural research and social, uh, social science research and gender analysis, we are still with the researchers held within the cocoon of maintaining the status quo. Now, why great is really great is that Transformation is one of the major concepts. And surely before we transform the rural smallholders or the gender relations that are in, we, our thinking, must be transformed. Yeah? And it's not that uh, we are going to, to build rocket science or start something new, no. Social transformative, social, uh, transformative social theories do exist. Transformative learning paradigms do exist. The question is, if you're willing to talk about transformation, are we also willing to start using transformative paradigms? And I think if we say yes, we go ahead. If we say no, we continue moving in circles. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I, I promised Cornell students at our host university here, I would give you an opportunity. Any questions? Yes. First of all, thank you, Candice, for uh, your wonderful comments. Um, I'm a student who actually came to uh, academia first from the field, and so I worked for five years in the field in Latin America before coming back to the university, which has been a nice blessing. Um, but I wanted to respond to the comments both about the baseline information, about uh, what the gender dynamics are existing in the community first, and also to really stress the comment that was made about transformation as a process. 
um, that there are traditional roles that have developed over hundreds of years, generations, that will change over time. Um, but that said, I'm, I'm curious about what your thoughts are on how, um, on how farmer field schools can play a role as a catalyst for uh, gender transformation in agricultural technologies uh, and innovations in particular. So often we see that the innovations come from the researchers to the field. And I'm wondering how you and my envision seeing an improved role of extensionists or NGOs as um, a proxy for extension workers to, to work better with women in agriculture. Uh, yes. And um, we've also got uh, just a little right now. It's a quick comment on farmer field school. Actually, your neighbor to the right of you knows more about this than I do. But um, the farmer field school programs which started actually in the Philippines with uh, pesticides uh, that Peter Kenmore <coughs> was the, the father of farmer field schools then spread across the world and it's become sort of the alternate extension model. Where farmer field schools have worked best is when they've been targeting one specific intervention that needs to be changed. Where yeah. farmer field schools have worked worst is when they try to do whole society behavior change and say, you know, this is the ideal you need to move towards and this is where you are, and try to convert groups, you know, a holistic change in the group. Um, because one, you don't know what that change is, uh, as people coming from outside really cannot influence that process as well. And, and second, making that change itself is very difficult. So, so that's where the success and failures of farmer field schools have been. Do you want to speak to that? Uh, I think, like uh, Henry mentioned, we can apply existing theories and methodologies to the new problem that we have, which is gender transformation. And personally, I think there is a lot we can learn from farmer field schools in terms of catalyzing changes at community level. You have communities coming together and engaging on a problem that concerns them over a period of time. So the principles that are applied you know, like on integrated pest management and things like that, can, can also be applicable to social issues like the one we are talking about of gender transformation, whereby you get men and women together and they are engaging. The subject of, the main subject of meeting or interaction or forming the group could very well be agriculture, but then the, their awareness is raised about the social issues that intersect with agriculture. And then they observe, because farmer field schools, as a, you know, they involve observation of the natural environment and social environment and reflection on, 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 you know, on how things are happening, critiquing things, and then learning in the process. So to me, I think it's a beautiful way of you know, tackling this idea and getting a community vision uh, of what the transformation can entail and the, the steps and processes that can lead to that. Thank you. Uh, let me take one last comment. It's already 10.33, so we're p uh, over time. But I really want to honor your uh, making sure we get. Thank you. My name is Saba Omayu, and I just recently was admitted to Cornell for the International um, Development Program. And I just am really interested in the response to the top-down question approach and if you feel like that is that hasn't taken, and if that's a good approach and why. I'm just really interested in that response to that previous question. OK. Um, did you have a question or a comment? I, uh, I just want to make a kind of contrasting opinion to the problems on the farm field school. Oh, this could get good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Controversy, yes, please. Uh, well, <coughs> probably so. I, was, I, I went around to visit some uh, farmer organizations in Western Kenya. Uh, subsequent to a sort of scoping study that had been done in the area of so that's rural social infrastructure. And it seemed there that, that sort of farmer field school, the term has become quite loosely used, I guess, but in some places it, been sort of stand, it has become a standing social infrastructure where multiple groups get together to conduct 
field trials, but at the same time to entertain a whole series of things. So going very much to that wide open extreme that you presented probably, but seemingly very successfully. And there were these subgroups to one that they may impress me, where one of the groups had a sub name of like the so-and-so, but it was an orphans group. And another subgroup of this farmer field school was called Hot Gravy. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I, I suspect that Hot Gravy and the so-and-so loons and orphans just have very different judgments of the options that might be put to them through the farmer field school. And they have probably very different resources and work and orientations and so on. It just seems to me like a great opportunity for that group of people to explore commonalities and differences among them for what might improve the performance of agriculture by multiple criteria. And I just, I really felt like this completely vague, wide open agenda is working great for them. So can I just quickly comment on that? And I, I, I completely agree with that, but I wouldn't call those farmer field schools. I would call them more like the, the self-help groups that are being set up in it. OK. So we've got a definitional. Um, do you want to make a quick comment? No, I was thinking uh, I really like the idea of uh, you know, talking about the rewards and incentives to make institutional changes. And, you know, I like, I like your Mike's radical idea to have a student working on these plates. So I was wondering, if we don't change the way we are rewarding the research and making, you know, how those researchers, for example, your student in your case, when you place after five years of PhD. So it has to do with the publications. Like if you, if, as a, I, I understand it from whose case, because, you know, we were talking about so, economics or social scientists working in field and, you know, if integrating gender or looking into that is easy for us, but for biophysical science, you go and like, take that step and then you know do that digital surveys and things and come up with publications. So my question is, are you really worried about the, the, the student, you know, getting a good job in a good place and how how institutions can change that? So it comes to me like how we going to change the metrics and to reach these end researchers, in your case, those students are uh, required, right? If we can do that, I see a way to change how researchers like faculty and their students and how we can cultivate it. So I just want to throw it up and then it can come with how we can really institutionalize. Thank you. Last comment. And what we're going to do is I'm going to give each person one minute to respond to it or give, give a closing remark or respond to a question. <coughs> but one minute, and then we'll be out. But one last comment. So my question will complement our question. Yes. So I think in the sense that um, Professor Fingali talks about the mandatory one year field um, work in India for the Tata Royal Initiative Program. And I'm wondering now, after these people get their PhD, do you have like a system where you can keep them so that you can effect transformation on the long run? That would matter. All right. Um, any other particular, particularly a student question? Okay, so let's take one minute uh, per panelist with your clo closing comments or uh, a reaction to it, to any of these conversations, and then uh, we'll we'll close the session out. Uh, shall we start with you and work this one then? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, um, I th I think the idea of um, looking at students and how they build up their careers is a, a really important one. One of the frustrations we've had is, um, you know, in the last 20 years or so, we've not had many young people interested in international development work. Um, but now that tide has turned around, um, and now you're getting a lot more young people interested in international development work. So we're coming in at a good time. So what my program's trying to do is to say, spend significant time on the ground, and then come back out, and then write up your thesis from that. Now, our program is still so young that we don't have anybody who's come back out yet, but we are watching that. And what I'm hoping for is that, uh, one, it'll create new faculty that will have on-the-ground experience that can teach students in the future. But second, um, these people will be great candidates for going to Gates Foundation, USAID, and all these other places and bring some reality to, to those organizations also. So I, I'm hoping we'll get there. We're still, we're still a long way away from that. But maybe a couple of years from now, I can answer that question. 
I'm glad you said it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, what I see as a concluding remark is uh, the realization that each of the disciplines have been working independently. The physical scientists are by themselves, the social scientists are, thems are by themselves, and probably all the other factors are not coming together. And I'm seeing a way forward where we are getting uh, to a round table with all the stakeholders and begin to talk about about something that is common to all of us so that we all, right from the beginning, have a common understanding for us to understand what transformation entails and how we want to go about it. Thank you. Okay. So probably the most important thing that I have, I would say, learned through this whole process, and this kind of re relates to your question, is I am able to train like, if you will, the next generation of plant breeders and the most cutting edge stats and computational approaches. But I think moving forward, and it may even be perceived as being radical, but now to also arm them with skills, having an understanding of gender and, and its context in terms of agricultural research, so that when they, they do graduate from Cornell, they can go out and do tremendous and great things because they'll have a much greater appreciation and much understanding of, from the applied research aspect that to be able to translate some of their essential or great findings from their research into something that's used by the general public or the end consumer, and that being like smallholder farmers, is they really need to understand the target population. And I, I think it is entirely possible to design research projects that are publishable and that have a gender component to it. Thank you. Second, and then we'll work up. I'm really stuck. Um, one minute, what, what can I say to wrap up? I think we're in a special moment right now where there is attention to gender and there is attention to agriculture. I think it's important that we not forget that we went through about 15 years uh, between like 1989 uh, and whatever 15 years after that was where we didn't have very much money for agriculture, the trend was uh, lowering investments, and I think we're at a point now where we're seeing a lot more money going into agriculture and going into uh, gender at the same time, perhaps coming out of the food crisis, people say, of 2007 and 8. So it's what are we going to do with that money? I totally agree with Deepthi uh, that it's about establishing the right kind of indicators as a start, but to me that's part of the package of the other things that I was talking about earlier of in, in, in institutional transformation. So let's figure out ways, all of you write those proposals, uh, do those projects, take advantage of these new funds of, of resources to uh, make these changes at your level and at the same time we'll work on the institutional levels. Uh, agricultural research for gender transformation. This, I think, is a very <coughs> challenging mission to pursue. Uh, risky business, new way of doing things. And what I'm hoping for us to be able to do is to package, first of all, be clear on what this means, and then package it in a way that others can understand it. And then because it requires long-term dedicated investment for us to realize the change you want to see, be able to market it to those who have money to fund it over a consistently long-term period. It also requires revising or redefining the rules of the game for professionals so that uh, the social scientists, biophysical, agricultural researchers are able to engage in new different, sorry, new ways to connect with, new, to make new connections that are able to make this happen. So I hope Brett can catalyze this. Yeah, I'll just add to what uh, Margaret has said. If we really want transformative outcomes, then we should start by transforming our institutions. 
and also adopting transformative methods of work. So before even the ink dries on the great work Hal is doing, start thinking in terms of great itself, the ideal concept of being transformative. Now, the transformative potential of agricultural research is not questionable at all. It's not questionable, at least in terms of improving production and productivity. But improved production or productivity, even if I would call it growth, will not necessarily translate into transformative, transformed gender relations. More will be required. And what will be required is methods of engaging our farmers, both males and females, in transformative ways between biophysical traits, but also looking at the social cultural engagement, the relational engagement of these farmers, not only among us themselves, but also with institutions of agriculture, research, extension workers, advisory services, and the like. Thank you so much. I thank you all for uh, allowing us the, an extra 15 minutes of, of the schedule. And thank you especially to our panelists. and. Um, to our moderator. <laughs>